thank you. We're ready to start. Seth, will you please do roll call? Yvonne Curtis. Present. Mark Mobenhill. Here. David Reeves. Here. Lynn Saxton. Here. Kate Turan. Kate Williams. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda, so we're going to move forward. First, I'm going to need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any discussion? Anybody opposed to moving forward? Okay. We'll take that as approval. Um, approval of the meeting minutes. I need a motion, please. So moved. Need a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Was that everybody? <laughs> okay, doesn't sound like anyone's opposed. Anyone opposed? All right, we move forward. We have approval of the minutes from September 9th. So the first thing on our agenda for discussion is the final copy and details on the best practices and student transitions. Um, Hilda and I had a conversation after we looked over the notes from the meeting from the full OEIB meeting to see whether there was anything we needed to adjust or incorporate. So if you will take a look at the document that has some yellow, green, purple peach strips that says best practice in student transitions recommended recommendations to OEIB board. If you would look at the footnote at the bottom, I'll read it, recognizing the time urgency of these issues, the best practices and student transitions subcommittee has incorporated, incorporated these topics into their monthly meetings and will be requesting time markers from agencies that help us monitor progress. Um, the feedback we got from the full board last week, really a lot of the questions were about what are the timelines, what, what is already moving forward, where can we start to uh, be able to measure some outcomes. And so uh, Hilda and I have taken that into consideration and that's what will be part of our scope of work for this next year. Uh, we will really be focusing in a, a great deal on the student transitions 11 to 14. So um, if I'm asked that question at the full board meeting today, what I will do is, is point them to our uh, plan, which we have copies to give to them, and show them that we will really be focusing on student transitions. And I think this is the perfect year to do that. We'll have the Accelerated Learning Committee report, and we'll have opportunities to work closely with the HEC and other groups um, I think that we can call people in from Eastern Promise and uh, the Regional Achievement um, Collaboratives to see, so we can connect the dots of, around all that work. So that'll be a primary focus for us. Uh, see, was there anything else? I think uh, the addition, other footnotes addition, were already there. Addition. Oh yeah, on the back page under Digital Conversion, um, if you will remember when OSBA, when, no, I'm sorry, COSA did their presentation to us, ensuring the adequate broadband is available statewide was a part of their recommendations. And we had uh, discussed at our last, last best practice meeting that we had left it off and wanted to make sure that it got put in to this report as a recommendation. So that's an addition. You see that highlighted on page two. So that, that was part of the overall strategic plan. I, I guess I just right. it's fine, but I just assumed it was in that one down the bottom. And just because that one of our committee members brought it up, we thought we would just call it out again to make sure we're really trying to listen to everyone, make sure that voices get heard and that we are pointing to the right work. Uh, are there any other questions, comments, concerns, anything you've heard from other board members or groups that we would want to know about? Mark? I, you know, I've vetted this with the superintendents in our region as well, and I, and I think we've gone through a pretty laborious process to get to these points, and I, I feel like we're there. And the other superintendents agreed as well and felt like we've hit the key areas, knowing that, you know, there, there are obviously best practices issues that aren't on this sheet. 
but I think we've done a pretty methodical process to get to where it is right now. And I commend you and Hilda for, for kind of staying the course on some of these, but also narrow, narrowing and prioritizing. Okay, great. David? Any comments? How about Lynn? Can you two hear us? Uh, I'm unmuted now. Okay. <laughs> Anything you want and to I'm, say? And I am too. So, okay. uh, David, you go first. Yeah, I think they're fine. We've discussed these already several times before, and I'm yeah. in approval of them. Great. Lynn? So, um, my continuing concern is kind of costing and market right. penetration in terms of number of kids affected, how fast. I think the prioritize, prioritizing as it stands has part of the information. I think we're still going to need to focus on those other pieces at some point. Right, and I do think that those are the kinds of things we can ask for in this next year. I think that there's enough sort of pilot projects going on out there that can give us some data where we would now be able to start to do that, I think. Also, at today's OEIB meeting, the um, outcomes and investments uh, documents that are provided actually start to get at potential number of students that some of these uh, uh, recommended initiatives would impact. So, um, Lynn, I, I can follow up and make sure you get that since you won't be at today's meeting if you'd like. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move us to 5.0 on our agenda, Accelerated Learning Committee Legislative Report, because it, uh, our conversation segues right into that. I think that what you will probably notice is that there's a great deal of overlap in the items we've identified in 11 to 14 that need attention and the things that will be in this report, but Hilda's going to take us through that. So um, we're very fortunate because Nancy Golden, who was the chair of the um, Accelerated Learning Committee, uh, is also with us. So it's any time she'll be uh, adding in some insights. Uh, as you recall, and I'm going to, rather than walk you through the 32-page document, <laughs> which you should have, I'm going to reference a one-page <laughs> fact sheet that Nancy and I tried to put together to summarize the extent of this work. And timing-wise, had their timeline been earlier for the legislative report, you would have gotten this much earlier, and then it probably would have even woven in more into your final recommendations. But their deadline was October 1st, um, and we actually submitted the report on October 1st at 4.59. <laughs> um, so as, it, as you can see, this was uh, a committee that was formed as a result of Senate Bill 222, and it was really designed to just re-examine and examine methods that were going to encourage and support our students to obtain college credits while still in high school. This recognized that there were already a number of initiatives in place throughout the state but there were also pockets and locations where students had no access to any of the options that might be available in other communities. Uh, the, um, the committee quickly established a goal that they wanted to be able to help every student in Oregon at every high school have access to at least three college credits or three college courses while they were still in high school and that they wanted to jumpstart this with some funding to support what we learned was additional costs really needed to sustain this work and to ensure the level of academic rigor that was expected when high school students are enrolled in classes uh, for college credits. Uh, the committee spent quite a bit of time throughout their year of meetings um, examining other states <laughs> They looked closely at, they brought in folks from the state of Washington to learn about Running Start. They looked at Colorado's model. They worked with the Education Commission of the States to analyze policies. They looked at um, new legislation passed out of the state of Ohio. And of course, looked at and listened to testimony on a number of existing efforts in our own state. 
Um, what they were concerned about was the fact that currently the model funds um, a um, student through the OD, I mean, excuse me, the um, uh, general school fund, K-12 general school fund, and then the schools have negotiated with their partners, sometimes a very low cost, uh, sometimes $10 a credit, um, and then what happened is as this moved on to a bigger and bigger model, I think that everybody, both partners, realized there was a lot more work that goes into this. For example, ongoing connection and collaboration between the faculty in the colleges and the instructors in the high school to ensure that um, the fidelity of the courses is retained and that there's professional development offered for instructors. It also recognized that there are differences in cost depending on who offers the course and where it's offered. In some cases, these are co courses are offered online with an instructor of record model. In some cases, they are offered at the um, college campus. In some cases, at the high school campus. Uh, the intent shifted a little bit over the course of the year to be a broader em embracing of a lot of different options, recognizing that districts and regions of this state have different needs and to try to do a one-size-fits-all didn't make good sense. But it was recognized that we needed to at least close the opportunity gap where some students, depending on maybe their zip code or whatever, weren't able to access some options. Uh, the committee asked for a very detailed costing out with um, proposed uh, funding formulas or funding mechanisms that would sustain the work and acknowledge that you must support students, you need blended advising models, you need to engage um, partners on a regular basis, you need to consider textbook costs, and you need to really encourage these offerings for students that are typically underrepresented in higher ed. And so in the middle of the page, you'll see um, what the recommendations were in the legislative report that was submitted October 1st. An additional appropriation of about 15 million was, re was recommended. And this is in addition to the standard funding that a school district gets and in addition to, in some cases, FTE funding that a college is receiving. This was designed to say that for every student, um, excuse me, for every course that a student takes, um, the partners would share um, $20 per credit um, that would be very specifically used to do things like pay for instructional costs like textbooks or lab equipment. Um, to pay for reporting, to pay for the supports that students need, advising, understanding financial aid and how taking a dual credit course can impact your financial aid, as well as the regular kinds of meetings that need to go on between um, the, the partners. This also was in addition to um, uh, a, um, uh, a negotiated agreement, as I mentioned earlier, currently many of them negotiate a partnership agreement, and all this did was to lay a, a floor and a ceiling, a floor of 15% and a ceiling of 90%. And that's just to say we understand there are different nuances depending on where you're offering the course and who's offering it. There was quite a bit of discussion throughout the year about whether or not advanced placement in international baccalaureate coursework is another option that helps students experience the rigor of college level coursework? And the answer is yes, that is true. There are some distinct differences in that they, they do not, uh, they have a nationally and in the case of IB, an internationally developed curriculum and exams and professional development that's already regimented and provided by an outside um, a corporate entity. So they didn't need all of the funding to bring the faculty from colleges in Oregon together with the instructors around advanced placement and international baccalaureate. However, it was brought to our attention that where there are real shortages are around the cost of textbooks, which continue to increase, and the fact that they, we still did not see sufficient and significant numbers 
of students um, for, who are traditionally underrepresented in <laughs> higher ed in those advanced placement courses and in international baccalaureate. So we really built in something here that would encourage and incentivize school districts to look at their class offerings and reach out to bring more students, particularly those from those populations, into those classes. In addition, it was recognized that um, uh, overall there needed to be some real targeted focus on reaching students who, who are typically underrepresented in uh, post-secondary courses and, and in education. And so you see the $15 per credit uh, for those um, high school students who earn um, these credits in the three college level courses. And again, the report recommends how those funds should be used um, so that they don't get, you know, just folded into a general budget, but they specifically go to develop any instructional skill supports for students, any advising that is necessary, um, maybe funding a course that would help students get a sense of what college is like and how to be successful, and of course expanding services and communication to families. An additional $10 per credit was laid out for um, the additional costs that we know could be incurred if one of those three courses was a career and technical course. Sometimes there are additional lab costs or equipment costs that need to be considered. You may recall also, if you've been following closely this, in this committee's work, that we also sent forward um, a strategic investment recommendation. This is a one-time transformational fund um, that we suggested could um, develop a blended advising model that um, really gleans the best that's happening in various projects around the state where they figured out how to do this and to identify those components and make that something that all schools start to incorporate. There was also um, a request to figure out how we could um, provide online coursework for high school instructors who were seeking to add to their um, qualifications around um, graduate, co uh, graduate coursework in the content area. And it, the feeling was that we could perhaps do that with a collective effort across universities that um, agreed to put forward a, a, a predetermined schedule of online classes that teachers could access during the summer months when they have more availability. Um, and you can see at the bottom there were some recommendations that were brought forward. Uh, Nancy Golden has met with um, both the uh, presidents of community colleges. We've talked with the provost council and we've also met with faculty from the OEA and AFT around what could we do to rethink instructor qualifications, particularly for this group of classes that we're talking about. We're talking about like uh, um, writing 121, math 111, math 115, uh, maybe a speech class. Um, and what we learned was that some community colleges already have a separate instructor set of instructor qualifications for some of the 100 level classes that's different from that which they require of instructors of 200 level classes so we're we're talking about maybe creating a special bridge of those classes that um, would then consider some other um, equivalencies around what might um, qualify an instructor and again, we just gave you the link if you want to go look at any of the materials of the meetings that were held this year, those are available for you on the bottom link. Any questions, comments, Mark? Where do we go from here? Where do we as a best practice or as a whole system? Oh, I'm curious, uh, well, that was it sounded flip when it wasn't meant to be. I really applaud the work of this group. Nancy and Hilda, you've been at this for a year and a half? Um, October. We started meeting in October okay. of 2013. And I've had the privilege of looking at the various drafts as they've come out as we've you know, tied in with the Eastern Promise replication sites and, and just given some feedback. And it's exciting to see different ways of investing 
for our outcomes. And so when you think of the Education Investment Board and our whole task, as I look at at least a concept of $10 of credit to the high school for career and tech, that's to me a game changer in that we're calling out the importance of career in tech, CTE, and we realize that those are very costly programs that, a lot, that have been cut because they're costly. We at least are bringing the conversation back to the legislative level on reprioritizing resources for this 11 to 14. And so I applaud you for that. So my question wasn't really flipped. It was, I'm excited to know where are we going next <laughs> with this? What do we need to do to advocate? Obviously, we have um, our legislators on that group, and this is a legislative committee. Um, I just think it's important that we follow through, and as it goes through the process and the fight for dollars began, that we're kind of staying on course and staying on message to support this work. I, I so, see this work as unique compared to other things. This accelerated committee, learning committee, was a legislative committee that tied to OEIB, chaired by our chief ed officer. It's a little bit different than some of the others, and I think the work out of it is excellent and some game-changing things here. I just want to make sure that not only the, our subcommittee, but OEIB is behind this to carry it through to June. So one of the next obvious pieces is that um, the committee began drafting a legislative concept. It's mm -hmm. called LC274, and um, there is another set of edits based on their very last meeting that is under being undergone right now. So there will be at least one more version before uh, the legislative session begins. But that would be obviously um, how to track this as it goes through legislative session. Uh, we understand from Senator Hass, who already released a press release on this, uh, that he anticipates bringing um, forward the full report for an update for the Senate Education Committee. It's likely to have the same request from the House Education Committee as well. So. Um, uh, if it uh, helps, um, uh, I can suggest that you could, as a subcommittee, add your endorsement to the concepts if you feel that you are in a position to do so. And I certainly welcome Nancy's comments and suggestions at this point. She's done a marvelous job of really convening and uh, facilitating all of this work. Nancy? Well, thank you. And I, I just want to begin by saying how important I think this work is. And um, what, what I know, if we're, when we achieve 40-40-20 by 2025, it's really critical to give students who might not have seen themselves as college-going students because they never had an opportunity to take a college class or they could be the first person in their family to, to go to college or think about college. When they get in these courses, in high school where there's a secure environment or in a community college with the support of high school, many of them go, I like this, I can do this, this is the pathway I want to be on, and I think we uh, really owe that um, to our students as we create the seamless system of education. So, um, you know, I think when you say where do we go next, a subcommittee endorsement would be great. Um, in addition to that, I know the legislation is being put forward, and um, we're all working very hard as a team around um, recommending stuff to the governor's budget. And so, you know, certainly this is one that is um, being considered in that mix. And you know, we just need to watch it and make sure that that it gets the kind of support it deserves to give students an opportunity to seamlessly move into college. So. Yeah. Just might add to Nancy that you know, looking at this in the big picture, I'm gonna be you know, pretty pretty blunt here that when we look at you know when we look at the sunset, when we look at you know perception of, of OEIB at times. Um, this is a win. This is a win where you had legisl a legislative bill passed that tied in the chief ed officer and staff to basically. Be the, be the legs. This is a tremendous collaboration with the legislature on 404020. It also is one that when you look at our 11 to 14 initiatives, we have tangible results right now that have moved the dial. 
you look at third grade reading, that's going to take a while. The hub is going to take a while. This one, it's there. There are credits earned from first generation kids. There are activities happening across the state that have been transformational on 11 to 14. So my, my point I'm trying to make is this, this, this is a huge win for a lot of different reasons. I think the subcommittee needs to endorse it. I think OEIB needs to endorse it. All right. Lynn or yeah, this David? This is David. Okay. David, go ahead. This is Kay. Um, this is Kay. Oh, hi, Kay. <laughs> hi, Kay. I'm going to have David speak, and then I'll go to you, Kay. Yeah, I, th I think obviously college and high school is very successful, and it's something we should be expanding as the report calls for. Uh, I think both both for reasons of uh, I think it helps students perform better in high school, and it obviously uh, research shows that it helps students uh, go to and uh, perform better at college. That said, I just want to make sure that we're doing it right, and there's, I mean, there's certain uh, things in the report that are left somewhat vague. You know, it calls for, it, in the executive report, it calls for uh, additional appropriation to implement some following requirements. I'm kind of curious who's going to be in charge of implementing uh, some of these requirements. I'm, is it going to be the OAB or another agency? And um, particularly in regards to um, some, some of the issues, I'm, I'm worried about what's a successful program now on a smaller scale as we expand it, and we should be expanding it to cover all students in Oregon, but uh, what, that, what that's going to entail as far as uh, investment and also just a ramping up of programs and collaboration between the colleges and high schools and that's left somewhat vague in this report how that is to happen it does call for involvement of the community colleges at, at the end of the report and through it there's some calls for that but it's left very vague as to how that is to happen and I'll just point to some things like instructor of record. I mean, that's a very good way to get, make sure college faculty are involved in these courses and maintaining, as, as uh, Yvonne said, fidelity to the course and maintaining academic rigor and even a sense of what college is like. But that, that what an instructor of record does is really across the spectrum. Some are very involved, some are, I'm afraid, just something on, on record. And I want to make sure we have this uh, working together collaboration between the colleges and the high schools uh, as we do expand this program. So I'm kind of curious how is this the report calls for from some vague ways to do that and that uh, colleges do remain uh, involved with the high schools, but who is going to oversee that and how is that being seen as being implemented? Nancy, would you like to? Yeah, you know, I think what's critical is, um, you know, OEIB, one of the big responsibilities is the key transitions, and obviously this is one of the key transitions. So um, we're also uh, a seamless system that includes not only the Oregon Education Investment Board, but HAC, the Higher Ed Coordinating Commission, and uh, ODE, Oregon Department of Ed. So we've got structures that are set up that we work very collaboratively. We're in the middle of putting together strategic plans that will ensure when things come out of legislation or get recommended into a budget that things get implemented. So this would just become part of that process to make sure we implement the things that we have brought forward from a policy level. Uh, I would say, David, co uh, collaboration is at the core of this. I really think this proposal um, speaks to that and recognizes that um, this would cost additional resources, that the K-12 system needs support, and the higher ed system needs support, and there's some shared additional costs that need to be put in place. So I think this recommendation, I know this recommendation, came from hearing uh, from a wide group of people and is in response to that. So, you know, I think in, the, in that spirit, we would just keep um, the, the collaboration up and, and uh, 
you know, make sure we approach this as one seamless system. Thank you. Kay? My only additional comment would be to reinforce that we need to move forward with the recommendation, but to ensure that we have fidelity and rigor. I think the biggest question that I hear is whether or not these courses are the same courses these, these young people would take if they were actually in college. So oversight, rigor, and fidelity, I think, must be a requirement as we move forward. I, I would just like to respond. Kay, that's a, a marvelous question. This is Hilda, and I'm actually uh, looking at the uh, coordinator for the Dual Credit Oversight Committee because um, we are meeting on November 4th to just have that conversation about how the standards that they have put into place around, um, you know, really making sure that courses are transferable, that they are equivalent, that that process continues. I know that Ben Cannon from the Higher Ed Coordinating Commission has also voiced his um, appreciation for that committee's work and in, in views that that will, that will continue on. Uh, obviously, that doesn't, um, you know, uh, preclude some good questions and discussions from coming forward, but at least there's an established uh, set of criteria that um, that people are already using as guidance, and we would ensure that that they continue to do so. Lynn, did you want to say anything to, uh, to this? Um, I think the question I have is, and I'm sure someone thought of this. So if you've already covered it, um, I got disconnected there briefly. The uh, there is a huge resource available online and at community colleges for um, academic credits for high school students. That there's infrastructure built, there's services in place. Um, our programs use it regularly. And, and I know it's different in rural areas, although I also know in rural areas there's pretty um, intense use of the online capacity that Oregon's higher ed system offers. So I guess my question is, has, has this been costed out and figured into the grand plan of how we, you know, meet the 40-40-20 goals and, and live within our means? Uh, Lynn, this is Hilda. I'll take one stab at this. I think that's also why you have a recommendation in the best practices sheet that we just reviewed that talks about ensuring broadband access. because. Uh, we do have some marvelous um, offerings for students that are online. Uh, the committee did spend significant time talking about that. We also did say that we want to make sure that there's some level of support for the students at the location. If they are doing this a course online, um, we know that there's some good standards that should be applied so you don't just say, okay, um, you know, Jamie, you're on your own, go for it. and. Uh, we hope you do well, but that there needs to sometimes be supports for kids to help them stay motivated to keep up with the coursework. Um, so I think that is in incorporated into this. The districts and community colleges would have the flexibility to use the funding that they're earning through the appropriation to do that kind of work and to make sure that um, where communities don't yet have access to online offerings, that maybe there's some work that happens in that area. Actually, I know the Oregon Community College Association has also raised their concern and wanting to make sure that there's at least five classes that students could access online. So you're right on target with concerns about that and as being one mechanism for students to have access. I, I'm, I'm certainly not. I guess my question was more directed at the, so I appreciate that background and, and understand the importance of the broadband piece totally. I guess my question was more in terms of the, as referenced in this discussion today, the kind of additional costs identified. Um, to me, I'm not clear on why there should be any additional cost in expanding access to college level classes to high school students. And so that's really my question is that, for, for example, I'm focused on for the Early Learning Council, the full day kindergarten piece and what the cost implications that have already been outlined for that. And my question is principally, have, is, is the total cost picture being looked at from, you know, 
five to through 20 to ensure that as we adopt these initiatives, there's sufficient resources to implement them successfully. I, Lynn, I think you're spot on, and I, I always appreciate how you bring us back to our mission. Just a little editorial comment there. Um, I, when I look at the report, what I really liked was using the existing models as a starting point. So right now, when you look at early college and the high school, where that's being funded is through the ADMW and the state school formula. That's the majority of your cost. 83% of our cost of teachers, that's paid for by the ADMW at the high school. Plus the FTE at the community colleges, which is you know, limited, for, you know, they get to claim one for every 17, all that stuff. What I, what I like in this report is it starts with the basic funding mechanisms for this program that make the program very doable and make the program sustainable. Plus, it looks at other strategic initiatives and, and carve-out type options to expand CTE and other things. I, I, I think you'll be taking some really nice baby steps because the, this program will be funded by the current formulas we have. And uh, I would add to that, Lynn, one of the concerns that we have is that um, we've identified approximately 200 high schools that um, don't right now offer any option for a student. They don't offer online classes, dual credit, AP, IB, early college, fifth year, any of that. And um, we feel like those institutions are going to need some initial funding to develop and start coordinating a, uh, an array of options for students, even if they just start with, okay, we're going to um, need to plan and schedule for at least this many course offerings online or um, through um, looking at who we have qualified to teach at the high school or coordinating this with our post-secondary partner. I would just say that one of the return on investments that is most impressive and the research is just reiterating this. I just read another study that reiterated the fact that what they have found is that if students in high school, particularly students in this, uh, whether you call it opportunity gap or underrepresented populations, if they take one dual credit type class while they're in high school, it has a tremendous predictive um, value on them finishing high school and matriculating on. And in fact, what they did was they looked at whether or not, well, what if you took more than one class? And they found that the additive part of adding more classes is not as important as that very first one. So, you know, they asked, well, what if you took six courses? Which some students take quite a few. They can take like nine, 10, 12 courses while they're in high school. But even just ensuring that every student has access to at least three courses, we think is going to have a very notable impact on, and a return on investment towards 404020. This is Nancy, and just in terms of um, your question about as we look along the pathway from birth through college and career, and we think about um, the resources needed for the institutions and then any of the additional investments, are we thinking of that holistically? And that is the job of the governor's policy people and the agency heads right now as we work um, with the governor and to recommend to the governor, uh, when you look at all of these, which, which ones end up recommended in his budget and how does that balance across the pathway? So we certainly are in that process right now. I Thank just, you. I just wanted to add one other a thing that sometimes is maybe not very obvious, and I just underlined it in uh, this one page sheet, is um, all of this work, we keep saying the word collaboration or collaborative, and it has to be collaborative between the instructors at both levels. And um, I think that sometimes people aren't aware about how thin our resources are to get folks together to do that. So um, we, we have resources for professional development. We have resources within our, our sectors for teachers to get together. But when you're asking people to do new work that requires them to spend quite a few hours together collaborating get, to get the work done, it, it costs money to do that. 
because the money we have right now is mostly teachers in classrooms serving students while the students are there. And so um, I just want to call that out because sometimes I think it's hard for us to even anticipate how much bang we're going to get for, for putting in that money at, at the front end. And sometimes it's hard to quantify initially, but I do think we have pilot projects where that work has already been done and we can quantify that. I want to just make a statement um, that is about this work and all the work uh, that we continue to do in the whole OEIB system and the whole I OEIB environment and that I think is we are on this pathway or this journey that has had a lot of people and a lot of groups doing work around first early learning and then we were really looking at K-12 things and now we have this, I think, this convergence of the work that's been going on already around 11 to 14. And I know that Nancy and Hilda are working on a representation to help us understand how all of that work can be uh, visualized and understood for all of us. So I look forward to us learning more about that as we move forward in our work. And I also want to call out that not only am I hearing from this committee, but I have heard from other board members in response to what we're asking for action on today. And that is that in this next year, we need to get very, very explicit about, I've wrote it, written it down a couple of times, timelines, the measures. I think this um, potential representation of what are all the pieces of work and we, who's working on what and who will be accountable for that work, uh, which includes the timelines, but it also includes what outcome are we trying to impact specifically. This one is obvious, but sometimes it's not always obvious, right? And how it relates to the achievement compact. And then also um, numbers of kids impacted. Sometimes when we talk about the outcomes, we don't always talk about the numbers of kids or even groups of kids. Because sometimes it's not a big number we're looking at. It's a new group of kids who haven't had access. And I think we who are in this work all the time know that. But I think we need to t uh, take special care to make sure we're continuing to call that out, especially as we talk about kids who haven't had access to college-going culture, uh, the advanced placement, uh, dual credit, and all the other options that are out there. It, it seems obvious sometimes to us in these reports that we're pointing to it, but as we get better at putting together documentation that calls out how all of that mixes, we got to make sure that those points are there as well. Okay, I am going to move us on to our next agenda oh, item. Just, Unless, just, oh, I'm sorry. Just want to make sure is this report okay. is this report going full OEIB for recommendation and support? So that, that's a good question. That was the step I, I'm missing here. I heard from our committee that definitely we want to endorse this work. So I, I would guess at this point we're looking for a vote, so a motion first to say, do we want to endorse this and move this forward? Because then I think what I would do in our report out at OEIB today is to let them know that's where we've landed and we'd like the opportunity to have the OEIB have the, this conversation, take a look at the report and have the conversation knowing we're sort of endorsing that moving forward. Right? All right. You want to make a motion, Mark? I'd be glad to. I move that we approve. You, you want, let me back up. <laughs> you want me to approve or make a motion for the best practices? Yes. That we approve this report? That we um, are endorse. endorsing endorse. moving it to OEIB. Okay. I move that we endorse the Accelerated Learning Committee legislative report and move it to the full OEIB for future vetting. Second? I second. Thank you, Kay. Is there any discussion before we vote? Any more discussion? Okay, I'm going to ask each person to vote so we just know that you're still on the phone and we can hear. Um, so those in favor? Mark? Aye. David? Aye. Okay. Lynn, are you still there? Aye. Kay? Aye. 
and we know that Kim is not there and I am in favor as well. So it looks like it's unanimous by the members of this committee that will move that forward. I will mention it in our report out today and then look to uh, Nancy to put it on the agenda for us to have an OEIB conversation about it. I really like the fact sheet. I think that's something that people would actually read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the 32 pages? No. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll still send them the 32 pages for reference. <laughs> All right, thank you. the OEIB custom. <laughs> okay, we're still talking about 11 to 14 years. We're going to move to item number 6.0, core to college draft recommendations from the Smarter Balanced, is that what? Yes. Yeah, Smarter Balanced um, Consortium Alignment work. Lisa Mentz from core to college project Sorry. director. What agency? Help well, us let me, uh, link the give dots. you a little background <laughs> yeah. here. Uh, Lisa, if you can come forward and sit right here, this oh. would be great. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce and welcome Lisa Mintz, who has uh, been serving as the director of a grant called Court College uh, since March, right? March. Is that it? March okay. Yeah. And um, I first, uh, I knew Lisa back when she was at the Oregon University System Chancellor's Office, uh, and she stepped in when we had a vacancy in the uh, directorship of this grant. You may recall that this grant also was responsible for the development of a statewide definition of college and career readiness that you okay. already approved and moved on to the full OEIB. Thank you for making that connection. This particular work, though, is a very critical piece, and Lisa will give you some insights on why it's important the process that she's gone through, where it stands right now, who else is it's been vetted with, and the potential that it has for our students in the 11 through 14. <clears throat> so as Hilda said, my name is Lisa Mentz. I'm the uh, Court of College Alignment Director. Just for a little bit more background, um, Oregon is one of 10 states that has a grant. Um, it started in 2011 from, it's a combination of Gates, Hewlett, and Lumina funds. Um, and it started on, or in the early days of the Common Core adoption, to work on the higher ed um, alignment piece with the Common Core implementation. And there's really like, there's a, four pillars that we work on. One is the college career readiness definition um, that we've already, that's been adopted by the OEIB. Uh, the Smart Balance Policy Placement um, work that I'm here to talk to you about today. We also have funded writing alignment projects with Education Northwest. Um, we just completed, we did one field test and we completed um, our first pilot in September. And we have done math alignment projects around Math 95 with EPIC. Um, and then we've done the Teacher Summer Institute. We funded some of the design team for that this, this past summer. Um, so just a little bit of background on our Smart Balance Placement Policy. Um, we began meeting in October of 2013. There's a group of cross-sector representation. Uh, there's a superintendent from Springfield. Um, <laughs> Hilda is one of the members. There's higher ed um, and, and community college faculty in both uh, math and English. And really, uh, it's called the placement policy, but really what we're looking at is exemption from developmental education. Um, we're not actually using Smarter Balance as a placement test. We're saying, if we're saying students are college and career readiness based on the Smarter Balance assessment in 11th grade, um, and they do something in their senior year, they take math courses or um, ELA courses, then when they get to um, community colleges or four-year institutions or private institutions if they end up adopting this, um, then they won't have to take placement tests. And we know it's, um, we have a high level of testing into developmental education. And one of the things that we were trying to do in, in terms of um, encouraging students to take advanced courses, which fits into the accelerated options um, in their senior year, and we want to make sure that if they do that, that they don't end up testing lower once they come into the um, community colleges. And, you know, we've all heard the story, somebody takes college level math in high school, and then they might go to one school, and they're testing into developmental education, and they go to another school, and they're testing into the next course. Um, and so, <clears throat> you have your policy draft in front of you. And what we're looking at is um, Smarter Balance has four levels that they use for um, policy de decisions. And I have the descriptors are there, but basically level four are going to be your top 10% or less of NAEP score students. They're you know, probably going to be the high achievers anyway. And we're saying if you, if you score level four on the Smarter Balance 
take something in high in twelfth grade and you don't take a placement test, you just go into the next course. Level three, we have a little bit more um, uh, requirements around that. We want to see if you're better. And then for level two and level one students, what we're really looking at is um, trying to develop supports for those students. Um, in the cross sector group, we have somebody coming to speak from Southern, Southern Regional Education Board tomorrow in our cross sector group to talk about some of the transition courses that are available um, that other states are adopting. And Oregon is about, Washington is also another quarter college state, and we're about four to six months behind them. They've just had both their, um, all their community technical colleges and the four years um, that have adopted this. And that's kind of, you might have seen it in the news, it's, it's kind of going around right now. California has also recently added smarter balance scores to their um, admissions requirements, their A to G requirements. Um, and so other states are, have, are following the same path, basically. Um, and so where we're at now is we've vetted this with Lots of, lots of different groups, I think, not using acronyms. Um, Oregon Math Education Council, we took that there Friday. The dual credit coordinators, um, it's been through uh, Hilda's Cross Sector Group, through the OEIE, um, Community College Council of Instructional Administrators, uh, the Council of Student Services Administrators through Community Colleges. Um, we were at the HEC Student Success and Interinstitutional Collaborations <laughs> meeting last week. Um, and so, the, the feeling so far is nobody's really had a problem with the idea of this. Um, and we've talked to provosts, and we know that the, the placement tests that we're currently using maybe are not the best thing, and people are looking for alternatives. Um, the, the questions come around how do we, like the technical implementation, how do we get scores, how do we get transcripts, um, timing of placement tests versus when the final transcripts come in, and something like, you know, things like that. Um, and so part of the subgroup would be um, convening a technical group to start looking at some of the policy issues that are related to the, that are listed on the back a uh, couple pages of the, of the draft. So the hope is, um, we go to provosts next week, and the hope is, uh, we originally had a fall 2014 timeline, uh, but we want to have sign off by the provosts or the presidents and community college presidents and uh, after we present to them, you know, figuring out what other information they might need to make that decision to sign off. I, I think in Washington they had one person signing for all community college and technical um, institutions. And that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. Do you have any other timelines once the sign off happens? Is, is there a recommended how long it might take to do whatever work still needs to get done in order to see people really implementing it? Right. Well, it would be for the incoming for the fifteen six. People are oh, okay. initially taking it for fifteen sixteen. Okay. And I should say, tied to this, um, again, like the policy piece is kind of the easy piece. Um, it's it's all the things that go around that. So one of the things that we're building in, um, we've talked to Oregon De Oregon Department of Education is doing some research with Education Northwest around the Eastern Promise and the Eastern Promise application grants, and so um, what we've started talking to them about is getting the smarter balance scores and being able to, to see what dual um, accelerated options or dual credit options students are taking and then how they do in their 12th grade year um, to start seeing the patterns. You know, if somebody's covering a four and they're taking this type of course, how are they doing? Um, so we've had the discussions about them uh, about that so we can start building, you know, the pieces that we need to start seeing how effective the policy is. Great. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Mark, go ahead. Well, go ahead. I think I heard Dave. David, were you going to ask a question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I think this sounds very promising, and yeah, I agree. I don't think the um, current placement tests are that 100% accurate uh, in themselves. So um, there could be other other ways to do this. It's just um, I think I would like, and I believe. Ben Cannon and Rob Saxon are speaking to this to the uh, entire board later this afternoon. Yes, one piece. Of it. Yeah. Okay. I just as I just like to see a little more information on the current placement test. And there was something in there about some of the scores weren't accurate. For example, that twenty five percent I think of 
Some students were actually ready for the college level course, although they tested into a developmental ed course. I'd like to see some more information on that. Um, I'd like to see a few more specifics on what other states are doing. I mean, that was mentioned uh, just now, but I'd like to see that. And um, it'd be good if the board could hear from some of the college presidents as to this. Uh, evidently, they're in favor of it, but it would be good for us to hear that. And finally, um, just a little bit more about the, was also mentioned in the report, the validation of smarter core tests. It's going to be something we're doing for the first time this year, I believe. So a um, little more information on that and how that might affect this. I take it these were, you were asking for input to develop this more, is that right? Because that's what I'm offering. Great. Great comments, David. Thank you. So I'm assuming we're going into a pilot here in that we have a lot of unknowns with SBAC and, and how that's going to play out. We're expecting results to go down, judging by the pilots or in the other states. But I just want to you know, throw my full support to the concept of consolidating testing. If there is a way that SBAC can provide this for higher ed and the transition for kids, and this is the one assessment they take so they don't have to take Compass, AccuPlacer, and the community colleges and colleges have different scores for that. Again, our system right now, this, this is kind of a gatekeeper for our, for our underrepresented kids. This is a really big deal because these placement tests are keeping our kids out. Now, we can go around and around developmental ed, and we're doing that. I get all that. However, the fact remains, the more hoops these kids have to jump through and get this level of an assessment, the more they're falling through the cracks. So we know that K-12 is heavily invested in SBAC. We are going to make a real effort to align curriculum with Common Core and focus on this assessment, which I guess what I'm saying is the kids are getting the most alignment and effort to Smarter Balance. They're not to AccuPlacer. Right, exactly. Okay, so I guess, you know, I mean, I'm hoping I'm not too random. What I'm trying to say is the more we can eliminate hoops and additional testing and align it to the one we're focused on, we're going to get more kids through. So, you know, I think this is another example of overcoming barriers along the pathway, which again is a core responsibility of the Oregon Education Investment Board. I think that's what you're speaking uh, to, Mark. I also understand the importance of making sure students do get to college, uh, community, or four-year ready. So, you know, it's, it seems like the three levels would really help ensure that. But. Um, you know, it's, it's just terrific to think about this, particularly when you start considering cost of some exams and stuff like that. It's, uh, it could be a big barrier. And I'd like to just add one piece. It kind of connects to both what Mark and Nancy said, and that is that when we know what is the measure, what success looks like earlier, which we can do if we're doing smarter balance along the way, it's, it's a marker all the way through the system. So now we start to line up our supports in the K-12 system even before kids are getting to that 11th and 12th grade year because now we know what we're pointing to, right? It seems obvious, but I think sometimes um, that in addition to breaking down the barriers, because I think this gets to maybe some of the things Lynn is getting at, where, is the, where are the dollars already being spent in the system that we just need to use differently and more effectively and efficiently and I think this gives us an opportunity to do that. Now we, we, we don't keep jumping to meet a different measure or a different marker of what success is, but we're all really focused on this picture, which is being provided by SBAC and the College and Career Readiness sort of definition. And now we can get to work on, so what really are those supports that align to that? And this whole developmental education topic can be polarizing and finger pointing. Yeah. You know, K-12 can say, our assessments don't align, our kids have proven they can do that, put them into class, deal with it like we do. Higher ed can say, these kids don't have the skills, they don't have a full senior year. We know all that. So what I'm hoping is that this SBAC conversation can focus the developmental ed conversation. Mm -hmm. And we are tied to that work as well. 
So I heard a couple of things, and I know that um, Lisa already has uh, complete documentation from some of the other states. So, David, we could follow up and send that to you right away. Um, I think that um, we may have to work with some other partners to provide you with uh, what is currently known about placement tests. Um, I think it would be an interesting chart to show you, first of all, just yeah. the range that exists. Um, and then in terms of the president's um, testifying, I think let's first of all hear back from Lisa once the provost council has met. Is that next week? November 6th. <coughs> November 6th. And um, then get a sense. They probably would be the ones to speak on this rather than the university presidents. And then um, the CIA, <laughs> which is really the Council of Instructional Administrators, um, and, um, and we can certainly work with Andrea Henderson from the Oregon uh, Community College Association to bring forward a written statement, um, you know, in terms of any questions, concerns, etc. I did have one question, and that is, and I should know this, Lisa, but I don't remember, in Washington, have they determined whether or not they are funding um, a second administration of SBAC in the 12th year? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if they've decided that yet or not. I think that's a critical piece that we may have to point out to our colleagues at ODE that if we've gone to this level of work and gotten them through that, and let's say they're within a certain point spread, um, first of all, Lisa's chart points out that what we should be doing for students who are at a one and two is use that as an early indication and provide them with the supports right. necessary to be ready by the time they graduate. But I think it would be helpful if we could have a negotiation or a discussion around the usefulness of at least some limited use of a retake on the at the 12th grade, knowing that that will have a cost to it. So perhaps it would be helpful, Lisa, if you could find out what the other states are doing and then we could summarize that research and provide it to um, both the OEIB and best practices and our ODE colleagues. And this is David, the, yeah, obviously the relevant academic officers who's ever involved at the college. I'd just like to hear from somebody. Sure, right. Great, thank you. Any more comments, uh, Lynn or Kay? All right, so I'm looking for a motion to also endorse moving this forward to the full OEIB, correct? Is that what we're doing? With the additional components or... I'm well, I don't know if there are well, additional This is David. I thought this was more just informational, considering this is okay. already on the agenda for the OIB, and this is the first time we've seen it, and there's a lot of considerations in it. Right. I, I'd agree okay. with David. Okay. I, I think that's where we are. So especially since we don't know where the provosts are and what that vote's going to look like. So maybe what we can do is bring back to us, once we know what that looks like, you provide the additional information then we can actually know, maybe you and Nancy can give us some idea of what do you actually need from this committee to go to OEIB or yeah, elsewhere you know, I'd like to endorse the work. One of these, okay. one page, page just, just a little bit of what you did today. I, I'd love to share this with the field. I think it's a very, it's a conversation that inspires some hope on reduction of testing, and uh, I would appreciate having that. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm just going to say, too, that page four is a great, maybe it's because tables sometimes help me, but I think it really does help understand that we're talking about not only the assessment, but supports and kind of the way we look at kids. So that's a great right. issue. And the final, the final version, the final signed version, would just have, you know, kind of an information page and then the signing sheet, like Washington did. I just provided a lot of information just so they had the background. Great. So when people are looking at it, they know why we're looking at you know, this. Thank you, Lisa, for your report, but more importantly, for doing this work. It's very exciting. I think we can start to see how these things are all lining up, pointing us in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, Jonna Timps is on next on the agenda to give us an update on the network portal and strategic investment data collection. Okay, and so, if she's coming up. Um, oh. Subcommittee members um, wanted to just remind you that you have asked us specifically for information as it becomes forthcoming around what we know about um, 
collection of information and, and evidence on the existing strategic investments from House Bill 3233 specifically and to some degree 3232 as well. So it's with great pleasure to introduce a colleague that I've had a, a chance to work with at the Oregon Department of Education. Uh, Jana is the person who is really galvanizing the components around what is um, probably going to be called a Oregon Education Network, and so she's here to share that, but also it, this is a perfect illustration of how OEIB has paid attention to its um, charge to work with agencies and to hone in on um, how we collaborate on collection of strong evidence of what's working and what's not, and that's of importance to this group <laughs> because you've all asked as best practices subcommittee, what is our responsibility for then sharing what works? So, Hi, well, um, Chair Curtis, Dr. Golden, committee members, um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm very excited. Um, for the record, I'm Jonna Timms. I'm the administrator for the Network for Quality Teaching and Learning at the Oregon Department of Education. And um, I think Hilda did a great job in sort of giving a little background on some of the information that um, I'll be talking with you about today and also showing the partnership, the strong partnership that I think has developed and is existing between Oregon Department of uh, Education and the OEIB as it relates to the strategic investments. So I specifically um, coordinate the Network for Quality Teaching and Learning, which is uh, 15 uh, high leverage initiatives. Um, that uh, was funded in 2013. Um, you'll notice in your handout um, that the network is made up of many projects. Um, as just a reminder, the network was established to support teachers, to better support students um, and student achievement. So I've included in this uh, first page of your handout uh, the investment that was made for each one of these initiatives. Uh, as well as the number of teachers that we are estimating um, currently uh, will be impacted by these initiatives. Um, and I really believe we can extrapolate um, that if we're successful, um, we will have significant impact on student achievement as well. So I'll just give you a second to take a look at that. Can we jump in here with questions? I'm sorry? Can we jump in here with Absolutely. Questions? Go for it. All right. I don't want to stop your flow. No, that's okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm just looking at these were all part of the strategic investments. These and, these were um, part of the 3233 strategic right. investments. Right. Yes. And I'm just curious, when I look at like Educator Effectiveness Common Core, only 1,000 teachers, um, so just, just, just how, why did you get that number? Certainly. Uh, great question. What we were doing was looking specifically at the work the PLTs are doing. Okay. So the PLTs send those teams yeah. um, from every district, 197, uh, we, I think we have actually about 190 districts, um, NESDs sending teams, and they're teams um, based on the size of the district. So certain districts will send 50 people, certain districts right. will send five. Yeah, this so, is your PLTs then? Certainly. Okay. Um, how are you doing spending these out? Pretty well. Um, what we're finding in, and what we do um, bi-monthly is we meet to take a look at all of the uh, investments and to look at the percentage of drawdown that is happening um, for each one of those initiatives. And then we, um, we work with the grants managers to make a plan on how we're providing technical assistance to the uh, projects and uh, to support that, uh, so not only the activities, but how they are spending that money toward the activities. What might be kind of cool is to have this broken down. Like we, we've had like that state map where the investments went. Yes. I don't know how much work this is, but from a practitioner going back, I know about the network, but I really don't mm -hmm. know all of these and how they're being implemented. Mm -hmm. and, it's a very, and it's yeah. great stuff and it's heavy investment. I would love to see in Eastern Oregon, for example, where are my folks? How much saturation for each one of these is that occurring? Does that would that be something that's doable, or would that be a train wreck? Um, I think we're here to give you the information that um, you asked. So train wreck. <laughs> 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 
uh, a train wreck that, no, not at all. I think that it actually is possible. Because I'd love to support it and say, hey, how's it going, Heidi? How's it going, Fred, exactly. with the collaboration grant? How's it going with the, who, who's accessing the small rural for that initiative? Absolutely. And um, as I sort of move forward, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the uh, Educator Network Portal and what we're hoping to do as we start to sort of connect all of these pieces together and get that information out to the field, so dissemination. Uh, so I don't think that that will be a train wreck. I think that's absolutely possible. So is that something that would be on the portal? I think it very well could be, yes. So I mean, people I, have short memories, and there's a lot going on yeah. with a heavy investment. we got to tell them that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. That's so nice. just a little thing. I just noticed that... Uh, you have numbers of teachers but not administrators and I keep feeling like we keep missing the whole leadership piece around our administrators <clears throat> and actually we have missed that a lot in the investments although I know some of these investments actually include that so I think you're gonna see that the impact in terms of numbers of staff members in the state is greater if you include everyone who's participating not just teachers I think that's a great point. Educators. And I think, yes, I think that that is actually um, maybe a misnomer that we should have been using educators. Oh, okay, uh, so that all, might include all of them. So in certain initiatives, absolutely, that does include administrators. Um, certainly the Teacher and Administrator Mentoring Project includes uh, administrators. Um, and I would have to go back to look at some grants. collaboration grants. Right, exactly. The so I think, I think you make a great point, and we need okay. to be more specific. So just clarifying that. Thank all right. you. Sounds great. All right, um, why don't you keep moving forward, right. and if other questions come up, we'll take them out. <laughs> so a little bit how we're measuring success of the okay. in investments. Um, we have developed a reporting system. Um, so we ask projects to give a baseline when projects were funded. So baseline information about um, uh, where they are and the data that uh, they, um, where they stood with their data currently. And then um, we developed a reporting plan for each one of those initiatives. And on your handout, you notice that, um, and I'm assuming everyone has a handout. Do I need to go yes, through? Yes, you, have, you okay, can make that know. assumption. Yeah. Okay. Um, on your handout, you'll notice um, that uh, I, I've included what are the pieces, the, um, the elements that those reporting plans will include. Um, I also included... Uh, on and kind of go to your back page. I apologize for not being stable back to back. Um, an example of what that data will, uh, will, will bring to us. So the progress reports, uh, this sort of interim initial reporting period will uh, be coming into us October 31st and um, includes, as I said, the element, elements that are on your handout. Um, this one pager is an example from uh, HB 3232, so uh, expanded reading strategic investment, of the type of data that we plan, uh, that we think we will glean from the, that proper support. So you'll see that there's some by the numbers, but there's also some data analysis. So. Um, uh, as an example here, um, you'll notice in the bold under by the numbers, um, we've started to extrapolate that um, when districts used funding to support expanded reading opportunities um, with adult support to students, there was much more return on investment than just uh, using investment to uh, provide technology. So, as a best practice, that gives us a really good piece of information that we can go back to districts and say, look, at we're finding that you know, all of these elements are important, but if you really focus your uh, time, energy, and funding uh, in specific areas, we know that we're getting um, more support for kids and student achievement uh, is being impacted. Um, I, I just want to also point out that as a part of the data collection, um, we're going to be in different places, and we know that that's going to happen. Uh, funding came out for the strategic investments uh, as, uh, let's see, as early as, I'm going to say, August of 2013, uh, and some in strategic investments were funded right away, like teacher mentoring that we've had funding for since 2008, so data is 
continually coming through, coming in, and we have some longitudinal mm -hmm. uh, pieces of information. But there were other initiatives that uh, were not funded until, uh, say, April of 2014, like proficiency-based teaching and learning. So even though it was a focus in the state, it was not an investment that was uh, specifically funded in, in, until April of 14. And so um, we are, we know that these are going to be in different places, that they're initial indicators, but I think they are going to be some um, exciting indicators of success or where we need to um, look into different places to put our, our efforts in the future. Along with other best practices um, that we are really trying to support in the network is the, uh, as Hilda talked about, the Oregon Educator Network. And we were funded, uh, we have some funds to support building a network not only through the initiatives, but um, really providing a, a way for teachers to connect and, and get resources. Uh, and we felt like the best way to do that was, was digitally. So using online resources, using online um, applications in order to uh, connect all of our educators um, to get dissemination around strategic initiatives and best practice, as well as resources linked to uh, Common Core implementation. And um, it's, it's, it's been a process. Um, what we're finding is that by doing some market research with the field, um, we are gathering much information about what, should, what the field really wants and needs as it relates to um, providing this type of digital network. So uh, the handout I have for you um, is an example of sort of the timeline, a roadmap. It just gives you an overall background of sort of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, we spent a lot of time with internal um, stakeholders. Uh, we have a uh, cross ODE OEIB team that has contributed to the uh, conceptual design. We have brought on staff uh, to move this forward as it relates to um, doing that market research that I mentioned uh, and really trying to figure out where our best support for uh, schools and districts are. Um, what we're finding is that districts are really out in front of us. And, um, and I think that's a great thing. And I think that uh, we have to honor that. And so we're taking a look at, sort of, instead of building something from uh, the ground up, really looking at the synergy of what districts have already created and how we as a state agency and in partnership with OEIB uh, pull, help those districts come together and help teachers to utilize all of the resources that are uh, in the field. So um, in November of um, 2014, just a couple weeks down the road, we will have our first um, beta uh, site for um, the field to begin to use as we're calling a sandbox to get in there, to start accessing um, some materials, to start um, to talk to each other around the strategic investments. We have a, um, one of the um, early adopters is the, um, uh, the ELPA, I'm sorry, um, the English Language Proficiency um, Assessment, thank you, <laughs> um, team who has uh, created a MOOC uh, for looking at language um, acquisition and looking at the standards as they're being implemented. Uh, around the state and so they will be one of the first ones who will be working together to um, use the site for collaboration uh, for setting those standards and to do some of that um, dissemination uh, that Dr. Mobile Hill was talking about around um, where that is really happening in deeply in different parts of the state. Um, we're going to then do, uh, a hope, not hopefully, it will happen, <laughs> a hard launch in, um, we are projecting in February, and uh, then there'll be, this is iterative, because as we know, um, there are technologies that we don't even know, and applications that we don't even know that are being uh, developed as we speak, and so we want to be nimble and agile enough in order to um, use those and respond and, and give uh, Oregon educators uh, the most 
support that we possibly can. So, uh, questions, comments? I just like to add one comment. Um, John has been very open to seeing how this system could also be accessible to the um, educator preparation programs so that you're not only, because quite a few of them are preparing people for advanced classes and you know returning people as well as the pre preparation of future teachers and administrators. So it will, it will have a com compounded impact once we can open it up to them as well. And it's opened up some dialogue with other states like New York has offered to let us connect to their um, New York Engage website, which has been funded much more substantially. <laughs> And as well as in Tennessee, where there's some really great pieces that were provided with whole class lessons with materials to go with them so that a class could actually debrief and listen to what the teacher's comments were as she enacted wow. curriculum around Common Core and some self-assessments that people can use. So it's just opened up a place to bring all of these things together at no cost to <coughs> educators in Oregon. So um, what I'd like to add is this idea, I, I like your, your page on the back, and one thing I'd like to suggest as an addition is sort of links to other work, um, just because that keeps coming up, you know, like trying to get it in our heads, what we're linking to, and what, what I like about what Hilda was just saying, and I, I wrote it down here next to your sandbox, so if you have these alpha, beta testers, I don't know what they call them, whoever the testing people are, I'm just going to tell you, in our district, we're frantically downloading everything from these states because we're afraid they're going to go away. It might be a great place to start to announce that these are, going to, these are partnerships that are already happening. So at first I was just thinking links to the work we're already doing in our state, but I think because our state is involved in so many other consortium, mm -hmm. state consortium work, our teachers hear about these because you're right, they're out there in front. They're, they are hungry and they have a huge need and we're not feeding them fast enough. So they're going out and finding it themselves. They're foraging for this food, they're coming back and telling us about it. But trying to get that communicated across the system, I think it would create a huge amount of credibility for the work that's going on here. It would create some relief. And the other project that I see a natural link, having been involved in the development of that, is the digital strategic plan. So some of the things we asked for, like digital curriculum, for example, some you know, so we have these old models of seven-year textbook adoption cycles mm -hmm. that don't really work, and we're still taking documents to our board to say, no, we're not doing that anymore because actually there's nothing out there for us to adopt. Um, we need to not only get rid of some of those things, but we also need to link with what what is the current work that's getting done. So that's one piece. And then just another uh, way of also saying again that educator again isn't just teacher right it's that link between the administrators and teachers and I know I already shared this with Jonna but just to call out for everyone that I made this suggestion um, I think this is a great site to make sure we have those great example videos I keep hearing there's great videos out there and our teachers and administrators are wanting to say so what does a, a real depth of learning lesson look like around this common core standard? We're all trying to learn together and now we have administrators who have to evaluate teachers who never taught in that environment, right? So we're learning side by side and it would be great if not only we had access to those, but could we also have best practice around what should professional development look like within our organization where teachers and administrators are learning together what that looks like and that the culturally responsive practices are not only embedded but very clearly called out because sometimes we end up in these conversations about well it's just good teaching mm -hmm. right right yeah. but if you don't really know that this is a practice that's really going to work for more of your students we need to call that out and make sure that those practices become explicit. So it's not just content, right? Now we're talking about standards around best practice and modeling what that looks like. Thank so you, you can tell I get excited That's about really this stuff. Exciting. The potential is just, <laughs> I think it's just amazing, the potential of, of having this there. 
And then this is just a general comment around o all of the OEIB stuff. Um, and I don't know what it looks like, but you guys are good at developing these maps. I just really like how this page is, and, and it's probably too much information to do that on every single project that we're doing. But I just no. keep thinking about the comments people are making, like where are the outcomes and where's the measures. And if we could do that, um, and it sounds like you're collecting that information on 3233, I think there needs to be a mechanism for really sharing that, especially inside the system with all these partners, school districts, all these other groups that are working on this. And I don't know what it looks like to share that, but this is really exciting and very hopeful. And, and I know I'm banging a drum here on a consistent theme, and I'll do it again this afternoon, but <laughs> we have done an awful lot and things are moving, yes. we've got to message that. Yes. And it can't be Nancy alone. Right. It has to be it has all to of be us. The whole system. As from ODE on through. Here, here's just one thought that is in my mind too as I look at that $75 million of strategic investments that went out last session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them really are gaining traction. When, it, when you think of our scorecard, Nancy, okay, I almost think we might want to think about a scorecard for how it's going with these. Yeah. So yeah. what's emerging, what's on track, what's accelerating. Mm -hmm. I would, you know, we're, I'm not going to do this today, John, but I would almost love to hear collaboration grants. Which of those three is it? Teacher and administrative manager, which one is it? And then when we talk about current reinvestment, yeah. what we, we put a lot of money. What's working that we need to continue? What are some things maybe we need to take a different shift or that might be now in the formula? But I look at this list, I would, you know, I'd love to say, give me, give me a score on each one. Then does that feed into we need a continual reinvestment? Because mm -hmm. this one's moving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the field is concerned about is what happens on June 30th. Sure. Well, and I do know that um, as a member connected to the strategic investment leadership team at Oregon Department of Ed, um, they are busy pulling this type of information on every single initiative. They just wanted to wait until, I think, October 30th is their deadline for bringing all that in. Because if you started too early in right. collecting that, then, you know, if the project was only in its third month of implementation, it wouldn't tell you very much. But they will be <coughs> providing all of this in a very detailed way to legislators at the February um, call out for that. So you're going to hear a lot more and see a lot more. You know, that makes me also think about when you said scorecard, it made me think about how we have to think about marketing to the different audiences. So we, we tend to have this policy view, um, but we have an opportunity here to really market to our own educators, to the field. So I just, I'm going to use one example. This could be a place where we're saying, Look at what we're getting done at OEIB. Now we have, I'm just going to throw out, because it's not just OEIB, it's also TSPC, but the, um, what is it, the biliteracy seal, for example. There's a very concrete thing right. Right. that points us to what we've been wanting to do for our ELL kids or to, to say we value language, we value what students are bringing to us. So it does a number of things. First of all, it says we're getting some work done. We're working collaboratively. We're getting somewhere for kids. We're calling out equity. And now we're letting educators know because I think about how much, like I right now I'm thinking, I really got to go share my system, all this, so people can get as excited as I am. And I never have time to show that, right? It's never the most important thing. They're doing Common Core, new evaluation system, new math program, all this stuff. I don't have enough time to share this for, to them. And yet, when I see them find out about something, and I'm just watching the emails go back and forth between our district and you guys about those Spanish dual credits, right. and we got our teachers now saying, how do we get to do this? We want to do more of this, and they don't even know where to go or where it's happening. Oh, they do. Well, now they do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have a huge uh, opportunity to have our own field be marketing for us and celebrating and championing the work and also giving us feedback for those multiple iterations, right? Because it will continue yeah. to change. Thank you so much. I do want to make sure that um, I give my colleague, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> Trump, a, a chance to, um, 
to weigh in here. Um, we really have been working collaboratively. Uh, I think this is one of the projects that um, I think illustrates very clearly the commitment by ODE and OEIB to be really good partners around uh, collecting data, uh, putting that data out there, and finding ways for um, all of us to get as much information back out to the field as possible. So. Sure, I'll just say a couple things. Peter Tromba, Oregon Education Investment Board. This work, uh, I just want to point out one thing is uh, Oregon uh, Department of Education, Oregon Education Investment Board, both have made an investment into research. And so there are two new research analysts over at the ODE and two new ones at the OEIB. And what's so critical about that is for every single one of these individual investments, I think typically what we would do is we would be around compliance. We'd be trying to see how much we spent out, which they are doing, and uh, have they turned in the deliverables, and that's pretty much it. And what we have now, because we have new researchers, is we have folks asking the questions, well, what data could we collect? And actually, what not only what data can we collect, but what is an actual accurate initial measure of what the outcome measure is going to be? And then how are we going to get that and call the, the really good data from the noise? And then how are we going to tell a story? So it's really interesting going to these meetings that are 99% ODE folks, is that the, the, the narrative or the dialogue in those meetings is very much more forward looking. And I think um, in alignment with what this subcommittee talks about is what are best practices, how do we highlight, how do we see initial measures, how do we capitalize, how do we share with the field? So for whoever had the foresight at ODE and OEIB to hire those research analyst positions, it's paying off um, to a large degree with these investments. I'll just mention two that OEIB is really taking the lead on. One is the story time campaign that's a little unique because it's a public awareness, public um, <coughs> community action campaign that's a little bit different than directly serving students or directly serving teachers. And it really involves measuring awareness, measuring a community's engagement, and also measuring barriers that are in certain communities that we need to overcome. And I think it's a real learning for the folks at the OEIB is how do you measure the effect of a public campaign? Our story time folks were very purposeful in picking the areas of the state and Oregon that would be the best places to do story time. But how, how do you see if that's changing or moving the dial on reading? So I think that's really interesting. We're learning a lot about how you measure campaigns. The second one that's also very interesting is collective action or regional impact strategies like regional achievement collaboratives and STEM hubs. That's the other one that's landed at OEIB. And we just uh, awarded, or just in the final negotiation steps in awarding a contractor uh, to do a very comprehensive um, assessment of RACs and STEM hubs. And what's interesting about them is there's really two elements to it, and I know one, I've talked to um, Commissioner Mulvihill a number of times about this, Board Member Mulvihill about this, is not only do we as a state want to know our RACs working, our STEM hubs working, that's really important information, but we also want to support uh, regional achievement collaboratives and STEM hubs create their own assessment mechanisms that are grounded in the local context but there really are, it does not going to take them three years to figure out what assessments they want to do and allows them to have um, collective impact, whether it's collective impact, capital C, capital I, or it's just collectively impacting. And I know that earlier in the year we talked with Eastern Promise and a couple of other regional achievement collaboratives. They have all this data. And, and Mark phrased it really, really well. We need some technical assistance to pick a couple of metrics and then just get on with it because we can spend a whole other year with the data. So as a result of the contractor that we have as part of their scope of work is to give technical assistance both in gathering the data, which we talked about, and also helping those regional groups pick those metrics that are most important. So it's exciting as... Um, Mark Lewis, who's sort of the lead at OEIB on that, said it's really going to be a co-created process, but I think we're going to have some great results that come out of that regional work that we know is very significant, but it's hard to get our hands around exactly what's occurring. So that, I, I appreciate and love hearing where that's at. You know, as I look at the racks, I think it's our, just, our job to do the how. 
but the what we need assistance with. Yeah. How are we doing in our region on workforce development and what are the jobs? How are we doing with our third grade reading compared to the state? And say, here's your best leverage point. Go after these things, yeah. then we can get right into the how quickly rather than process. And I'll just add, because you mentioned it frequently, that we've also commissioned a return on investment report that we just got into OEIB. We're just beginning to understand it along with Brian Reader from ODE and outcomes and investments are going to talk about it on Thursday. But one of the key things other states are doing uh, is looking at regional return on investment and regional expenditures and trying to look at and outcomes around investments in that respect. I think it's going to be very, very interesting to yeah. start to look at that urban versus rural and yeah. the different regions. So, so I just this, wanted to... This is David. I, my apologies. I have to get off the call. I've got another meeting. I'll see everybody at the main board meeting at 1. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Lynn, do you have any comments on this topic? Okay. Lynn? All right, I'm going to move forward unless I hear your voice. <laughs> Anything else from Mark? Okay. okay. So thank you. Uh, I know that at this time you don't need anything from us, but we certainly would like to hear how the project is going. And um, again, I still think that idea of starting to call out what OEIB is doing there is a way to kind of help sort of validate all the work that's going on and advertise it. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks to both we're of you. We're going to ask Peter to stay right yep. there because right. we're going to do a quick update for you on the next item. At our last meeting, um, one of the discussions that we had was what is the responsibility and role of the best practices subcommittee in terms of um, identifying what's working and then sharing that information with others. And so one of the recommended um, actions was that we get together with um, Lynn Saxton and Mark and Peter and myself. We started that process. We had an initial <coughs> conversation with Lynn, and I'm going to ask Peter to summarize that, and then we're going to pull back in and get all four of us again to sort of take the next steps towards what that looks like. So you want to kind of summarize sure. what you... Uh, first, I want to just identify Shani Garcia, Deputy um, Research Policy Director at OEIB, as she's another member of the team at OEIB. And one thing, even before this subcommittee asked us how we would start to disseminate best practices, we've been having a parallel conversation. We have professional researchers now at OEIB and ODE that are doing really, really good work. There's actually really good work going on across the state at all the public universities, community colleges. There's a lot of great research out there that's not penetrating to the field. In, in formats that make a difference to teachers, administrators, superintendents, and others, or parents. And so we've been having a discussion about what's the format for an OEIB research team bulletin, or communication, or email, or website, or what have you, and we're working on that. And right at that same time, just a couple of weeks ago, Hilda uh, asked that we have this conference call. And I, I think one thing that's critical about that call is that there's already a model out there that Lynn identified for us that exists for early, early learning areas. Uh, and, the, and then the name of the model now, we couldn't, do you remember it, Hilda? We got the oh wrong my name goodness. first. Lynn, uh, do, you Lynn do you remember the name of the model that we looked at that's so cool? It's in my notes, I'm sorry. Okay, it'll, it'll, one of us will remember it in a second, but Lynn was able to identify for us, for early learning, for parents, or for early learning providers, if you could do one thing, or you could do two things, this is what research unequivocally says, you need to do this, you need to do that. And that's hard in K-12 and post-secondary education, because as kids get more complicated and outcomes become more varied, varied, it's not that simple to put your finger on one thing, but it's also not impossible. And so I think the challenge that Lynn gave to us is, what are the top 10? If there's something that could come out of best practices or OEIB or a consortium of folks looking at it, what would we say to teachers? What would we say to parents? No doubt about it, prioritize these things. One thing Lynn held out on the phone call is instructional time. Is there complete agreement that a longer school year, longer school day, year-round school, what have you, is always good? Do we always want to be in favor of that? Um, I'm not 100% sure that that's exactly the case in every single case, but that's a really good one. And what are the other ones that we'd want to call out in an infographic 
or in some mechanism that we could find its way to everybody in Oregon as much as possible so we can get some tra traction around that. And so we've been discussing that in our team. We haven't, we don't have a conclusion yet or a presentation. I'd love to, to do it together with this group and then Quality Ed Commission. When I was on that commission, I presented to you folks about two years ago, I remember it really clearly. You folks were sitting right here and we talked about some similar ideas. Can we line up together? The Quality Ed report echoes a lot of the things that have come out of best practices. So I think it would be good if we could speak with one voice. Peter, so I'll just kind of stop. Great and, idea. That's awesome. Yeah. Peter, you probably weren't around. It was early OEIB when we had that visual. If you invested in third grade reading, then here's what your score is. Remember that? Mm -hmm. It was interactive. We tried to have them like that on the QEM too yeah. about yeah. 15 years ago. And that, that was so compelling to me because it showed that you move the bar third grade, but fifth grade you don't as much. So that, you know, there's just some takeaways. We could totally do that. It yeah. was, it, it, I'd never lost that, and the reason why it was interactive and it was a visual. So that's just an idea as we move forward. I love where you're going with this. This could also greatly help the achievement compact discussion. Yeah. yeah. So we are struggling with priorities on the achievement game, yeah. compact, and we know every one of those are very, very beneficial. And we know all those cells and, and all of our kids, that's all beneficial. That's not the argument. The argument is where do we invest and prioritize? And how much do we do that? Well, in a way, I've been thinking, we haven't had the trajectory. We haven't had the research. We have and we haven't. But where you're going right there, I think that could really narrow that conversation greatly. Then I think you market that with COSA. You market that with OSBA. Imagine, imagine Morgan, if you had at OSBA at the fall conference, here's the research-based top ten. Those board members <laughs> were a lot of grief on superintendents on November 20th when they go back to their boards. But it would really be a great conversation. Well, it also lines up the conversation so they are more collaborative versus one organization taking a stand on one component versus another and sort of pitting them against one another. I mean, politically, we know that happens anyway when we get down to sort of votes and that kind of thing. But as an educator group, <laughs> meaning big group, capital E, I guess, um, that we would be all sort of saying the same thing and pointing to the same things. Because we've seen that how that works, <coughs> even just in getting OEIB up and going, but imagine if we all were really talking about the research and what we knew made a difference. When you sit in school board meetings, that's where the decisions are made yeah. to where the resources are allocated. That's where it changes or it doesn't. And you sit in on those, and you've got seven elected people who this isn't their full-time career, and they're good people, and they're committed, but they start throwing ideas around, and it's not research-based. So the time one's a perfect question. Should we do a four-day week? Should we do a five-day week? Should we add summer school? Should we add preschool? We have the Five, shortest school year. Smaller class size. Smaller class sizes. <laughs> but wait a minute. He's just said number one is teacher quality, so shouldn't we do this instead of that? And it becomes muddled, paralyzed, the calendar pages flip, and you just <laughs> roll up your cola, your cola and your that's our current way we operate. We're very local control, but we don't give enough support to those board members in particular, and the superintendents in particular, to say time is important, but teacher quality is number one. And teacher quality then means this. And here are the strategic initiatives in Oregon to support that. And here's an achievement compact that aligns to that. And we say that over and right. over and over until finally it clicks that seven time. Well, not only that, we reach down deeper in the system because it's much easier as a superintendent and board to move your funds where you want them to go when you've also got your teaching staff behind you saying, yeah, that's what you ought to spend the money on, right? All right. Well, we in, Anything well, we else you need? Field turf too. So, anything you need from us, where, the, where will there be a time when you have another report to share with us about where that research is going? I'm yes. assuming that you and Hilda will stay in touch yeah. on that one. Yeah, and then maybe I've got some really concrete ideas about how we could try to operationalize at least a, a mock-up or maybe a 
sandboxed version of some of these interactive ones. So that's very helpful. Cool. That'd be great, and especially if it could <coughs> center around the 11 to 14 work that we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on. I don't know if that's possible. We can but just make when that it the does, first group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The research on reading is so much stronger, as, right. I, as I imagine, if you show a tool or the early investment, late, you know, so and maybe it's as strong as 11 to 14. I just know the <coughs> early ed stuff so much better. Good. All right. Sounds great. Thank you. Anything else from Lynn or Mark on that? No? Sorry. All right. Item 9.0 yes. is simply to remind you that you have an updated scope of action for 2014-15. Um, and we are lining up folks. Um, and you'll, you can see that quite a few individuals um, are already listed as um, joining us for discussions. Um, as we move forward. So our next meeting, uh, we'll be hearing from um, uh, Serena and others around chronic absenteeism and uh, looking forward to some folks from Oregon Department of Ed updating us on uh, digital conversion and where we are with English language uh, transition research. And then the December month, we're right back on 11 through 14. So this is there for your um, guidance and understanding where we're going and our next meeting is November 18th just a reminder because of Veterans Day so we had also suggested um, having Lisa come back and tell us what the provost said basically mm -hmm. and it looks too. like we could put that in on the 18th as well because she'll have that information by then great we can have that in there Okay, and I don't know if there's anything around educator quality that's new that hasn't come to this committee, but that is another area we could think about. Maybe we a can conversation with Jackie Chamber okay. on that one. All right. We do have uh, three people who signed up for public testimony. Remember, we're, we ask that you spend no more than three minutes. Seth will be our timekeeper, and he'll let us know at one minute. And the first one we have up today is Marla Edge. You thought it was a sign-in. All right. Thank you. Jim Anderson from King Elementary Site and Easy. Operation Easy. Operation Easy, okay. Thank you. I wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, say that the uh, accelerated learning uh, it's, it's so important that uh, there be children in the end of high school that can take advantage of this. And I think it needs to be publicized at an earlier time, especially in eighth grade counseling, so that the children can look ahead to that and maybe we can reduce the leakage in eighth grade. The, the failure pipeline of students that aren't ready to, ready for school, is of course another cause for fewer students able to take advantage of accelerated learning. The, uh, Students in the failure pipeline uh, who are behind are already by fifth grade talking about cracker education and that attitude becomes overwhelming and uh, affects their choices. I was very interested in the uh, network program that uh, gives $4,000 per teacher for early education training, but only 100 teachers are taking advantage of it. I think we need more teachers taking advantage of that program. And of course, to say again, the, the key issue is uh, school readiness for uh, so many students and uh, 
getting best practices, uh, maybe even going further afield from the standard tradition and getting into uh, Vygotsky's student plan adult play and uh, Montessori, other things like that, which I don't think are uh, on the table yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Dr. Dalker? I, uh, <clears throat> I'm very much into quotation uh, from uh, people with wisdom. Oh, I love it to go into the, uh, you know, to define what they're saying. Because sometimes they know what they're saying. Gandhi said, uh, you leave uh, the change that you want to see. Uh, you be the change that you want to see in the world. I, I know all this kind of quotation. Mother Teresa, they're all over the place. Uh, I don't have any quotation on Twitter. But Mark uh, did give me some stuff this morning to stay on course. Stay on course. What I want to say to you is to stay together. Uh, you got the message, yeah. But how we stay together? Because we we tend to go like this, and we miss it. I, I don't know whether we are in a competition of trying to out talk each other. Oh, I want to prove that I know better than you do, or some, I don't know how we, but we tend to go so much all over the place. Uh, we want to know where we're going, and then we go together. Uh, she won, you, this morning, you were sharing how you get here, because I was trying to find out how she got here, uh, from uh, Forest Grove and then from there through banks and but I'm still going to Reed College or uh, PCC. I know where I'm going but I'm going and you were lucky this morning you didn't have a flat tire your engine wasn't smoking because you would call a triple light but you're still going you still because you know where you're going so once we know where we're going Oregon Education Investment Board. We know where we're going. We stay together and go together. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I was looking at this table. If I want to move this table over there alone, you know what I do? I drag it. Mm. <laughs> but if I get Dr. Uh, yep. Golden to come Very over much. and help, you pick it up from here. Pick, you know what? Just pew, pew. Right. It's just so easy. Isn't that beautiful? Together. I'm going to keep on sharing you all. One of these, I'm going to come here with my skirt and, yeah, <laughs> you know, the pump Come on, let's go. Thank you, Dr. Dapple. Thanks for, we have, we have our own wisdom leaders right here in our room, That's right? right. <laughs> well, thank you all. I'm going to adjourn this meeting right now so we can have a little lunch before the next one. Thank you to everybody. It's 12.02 and I'm adjourning.